his wisdom. Hello, Bobby Ann. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathleen Quo. I'm a program manager with Nevada Humanities. And on behalf of the organization, it's my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. So for those of you who don't know who we are, Nevada Humanities is our state's affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. We try to connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of Nevada. So this creative workshop series is a part of our Nevada Reads programming for 2021. This year, we selected two memoirs that encourage us to celebrate and appreciate the natural world and to think more deeply about where we live and our connection and responsibility to the earth. So the workshop series was inspired in part by the themes and the illustrations found in one of those memoirs, World of Wonders, in praise of fireflies, whale sharks, and other astonishments by Amy Nezuka Matatil. It's a really beautiful book, Inside and Out. And if you haven't read it yet, I really encourage you to do so after the workshop ends. Really, really lovely book. So before I introduce our workshop leader today, I wanted to acknowledge where I'm sitting today in Nevada. So we gather on the traditional land of the Northern Paiute, the Southern Paiute, the Western Shoshone, and the Washoe people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. So you may be from an indigenous community yourself and wherever you may be watching this event, you are on indigenous land. It's up to us to learn whose land we live on. And so we, we're gonna share a link in the chat to help you with this. Moving forward, our aim is to respect those before us, those among us, and conserve and preserve for those who are yet to come. So as we engage in conversations about the natural world and the land we inhabit during this year's Nevada Reads programming, I hope you're just all moved to continue learning about how to be better stewards of the earth. So finally, programs and events like this aren't possible without the coordination and support of many people. And we're thankful to bring you this workshop series in part from a grant from the City of Reno Arts and Culture Commission. So I want to introduce our wonderful workshop leader for today. Cynthia Scholl received her Master of Science in Biology from the University of Nevada, Reno in 2012 wow. and her Bachelor of Science from UNR in 2008. She is passionate about both Great Basin Ecology and about science education. She co-founded Nevada Bugs and Butterflies, which is a local science education nonprofit, and she's the educational coordinator for the UNR Museum of Natural History. Since her first backpacking trip to Table Mountain in the Monitor Range at age two, she has loved exploring in the Great Basin. Over the past few summers, she's especially enjoyed roaming the Great Basin looking for rare species of butterflies for a project with the Nevada Division of Natural Heritage. Sharing the diversity of plants and animals in Nevada is one of the greatest joys of her life. So Cynthia, we are so thrilled to have you here today and I am going to turn it over to you now. Great, thank you everyone for being here with us today. I am here actually at the UNR Museum of Natural History. And so in the cases behind me are some of our insect collections. Uh, some of them are from Nevada and we also have some from around the world. So I just wanted to um, thank Kathleen for inviting me here and for that wonderful introduction and reiterate that if you have questions or would like me to elaborate on something, please just put it in the chat or interrupt me. I'm more than happy to make today sort of a conversation if possible. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I have put together a lot of pictures. So hopefully that is one thing that inspires you about the butterflies of Nevada is to see a lot of them here. Um, and I thought I might start by telling you how I became um, really enamored with butterflies in Nevada and um, wanted to commit a lot of my life to learning more about them and looking for them. So this is me in my um, second year of grad school looking actually for caterpillars at Washoe Lake. So I got to design this experiment and um, it meant doing a lot of this, <laughs> putting my head down in the ground looking for this. So does anyone have an idea of what is going on in this picture? Might be getting a drink. <laughs> getting a drink. That's absolutely right. So this here is a caterpillar, and there's two ants that are protecting it. 
And so this is what we call a mutualistic relationship. The uh, caterpillars produce this sugary solution called honeydew. It's the same thing that like aphids Ooh. might do. And in um, return, the ants protect the caterpillar. So if I went and I shook a stick or poked this caterpillar a little bit, the ants would attack that stick. Uh, so I really enjoy that all of these incredible interactions are going on under our feet and sometimes we don't notice them, right? This caterpillar is one of kinds of plants. One of those kinds of plants is this astragalus here. And there's this crazy mutualistic interaction between these caterpillars and ants. This caterpillar um, is pretty small. I wanted you to get a sense of that. So this is sort of the uh, caterpillar, the size it would be when it's about halfway or three-fourths grown. So they don't get very big, which means that the butterflies that they turn into are also not very big. And this is the butterfly that these caterpillars turn into called the Melissa blue butterfly. So here um, we have, we can start thinking about uh, butterfly morphology. So how they look um, from the upper side and underside is really important. When you're looking at these tiny blue butterflies, uh, you often tell what species it is by looking at the underside of the wings. So to know this is a Melissa blue butterfly, I see orange on both what we call the hind wing and the fore wing, and I see these iridescent dots. It would be easier to see if we were in, uh, if you were looking at it in person, but these blue dots here are super shiny iridescent. And then the butterfly on the upper side, if it's a male, it will be iridescent blue. And if it's a female, the upper side will be brown and orange. So the males and females look totally different. Which when you're trying to collect just females because you want eggs or something like that, it's very nice. It's very nice that they look so different. Um, so I wanted to just uh, give us a sense of diversity. So we know there's about 215 species of butterflies in Nevada. I hope to know them all <laughs> um, someday. I'm still learning. There's 750 species in the US and about 17,000 species of butterflies in the world. Okay, a question, question time. Which of these do you think is a butterfly? Which of these do you think is a butterfly? The one with dots? Mm. Maybe. The one with dots? Yeah, that's definitely a butterfly. Anything else? So I would tell you there's these uh, general rules about moths and butterflies, right? A lot of them can get broken, but we can think of that moths usually have fatter bodies. They usually sit with their wings spread open if they're sitting still. Um, <clears throat> but really the best way to tell is to look at the antenna. So if a butterfly or an insect um, has these clubs, we call them these fat ends of the antenna, it is a butterfly. And then moths, uh, their antennas can end in sharp points or they can be really feathery. So here, these are actually two day flying moths. So you could see these moths um, out in the day. This one is pretty common. I think even maybe more common in Southern Nevada than up where I am in Northern Nevada, uh, Sphinx moths are awesome. Another name for them is a hummingbird moth because if you see one in the twilight, sometimes visiting a flower, you might at first think it's a hummingbird. And then we have our two butterflies here with their clubs or their um, fat, fat ends of their antenna. Okay, another identification question. Which do you think is the monarch? So the monarch is the one here on the left is the monarch, but we actually have quite a few rather large orange and black butterflies in Nevada. So we'll talk about those other two a little bit later. 
I wanted to just show you some of the variation in butterflies that we have here. So all different colors, lots of different sizes. Swallowtails are some of the biggest butterflies that we have in Nevada. And then I notice when people are just learning their butterflies, um, it's important to start to train yourself to look for things that are smaller than you think many butterflies are. So these blues, this is actually confusing, called a blue copper. Um, they are pretty small and this skipper is also a very small butterfly. Some more butterflies down here in the bottom right is one of my favorites. My favorite color is green. So of course this Sheridan's green hair streak is one of my favorite kinds of butterflies. So I was wondering if anyone has seen any butterflies recently or maybe has a butterfly question for me to get us started. I have a question. So this is the opposite to your question. I have not seen any butterflies recently in Las Vegas, where I'm currently from. Um, and I was just wondering, is that just because it's so hot outside? Like we're going through a heat wave. It's like 113 degrees this weekend. Is that a reason that I wouldn't see butterflies? So we will get to this more at the end, but one um, sort of sad thing is that butterflies are definitely in decline. So I partly noticed that I just see fewer butterflies than I did a few years ago. But in terms of heat, butterflies can't handle it, just like we can't handle it. So if you live somewhere really hot, butterflies are going to be more active in the morning and then again in the afternoon. Butterflies won't be active if it's dark. Um, they won't even be very active if it's getting dark. So there's just maybe a few hours in the morning where it's bright and sunny but uh, not too hot where they'll be active. And then they'll be active again in the afternoon once it cools down a little bit. Also just like us to deal with the heat, they need to drink a lot. So that is the other way that they deal with that is that they visit a lot of flowers and drink a lot of nectar to deal with the heat. Um, <clears throat> at the end or near the end of the talk today too, I will have some suggestions for looking for butterflies. So hopefully after this talk, um, whether you're in Northern Nevada or Southern Nevada, I have some ideas for you of where you can go out um, and look for butterflies. Yeah, I saw a really pale yellow one, but I have a probably about 10 creosote bushes in my front yard, which still have uh, some blooms on them. And then a really shallow watering place for the hummingbirds and stuff. But he was very awesome. small and kind of a pale yellow. And he flies around. I don't even know how it gets from point A to B because it, it seems erratic. But erratic? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm wondering, it could be one of these sulfur butterflies. Um, if it's not too big, those are, or they're, you know, orange and yellow. Um, in each of these, so these are our five different butterfly families. And in each of these photographs, somewhere I've put a dime. So you can sort of get a sense of how big these butterflies are. Um, so that might help you with that butterfly that you're seeing in your yard. And I love, um, that you have water out. So a water dish is something that lots of um, insects will use along with birds and mammals. Lots of animals will need that water, especially um, down south or in the, the hottest times of year anywhere in Nevada, really. <clears throat> so in the uh, last few pages of the book, World of Wonders, if you've read it, Amy talks about how important it is to know the names of different animals around us or insects. And I can tell you that uh, studying insects is definitely something that you need to do for many lifetimes. There's so much to learn, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time today, even though um, it's quite a bit of information, just introducing these five families to you and giving you a name to use for some of these butterflies when you see them. 
If you are really interested in learning your butterflies, these are our two favorite butterfly guidebooks. Um, this one, the Kaufman Field Guide to Butterflies of North America is something that I think I might own five or six copies of. I try to have them in all of my cars and my vehicle, uh, field vehicles. So it's something that I, I still use all the time. Um, so again, I'm going to spend a little bit of time introducing us to these five families of butterflies so that you know them. Swallowtails might be one that you're already familiar with. There aren't too many species in Nevada. These are the four commonly seen species up north. They would be pretty similar in southern Nevada. The two-tailed swallowtail is one of the biggest butterflies in Nevada. Um, in Southern Nevada, you can get a stray giant swallowtail too, which is even a little bit bigger. Whites and sulfurs are all sort of medium sized butterflies, uh, maybe about the size of a quarter is a good way to think about these. And just like I was talking about for the blue butterflies to identify them, it's really important to look at the underside of the wings. So here you can see to tell between these, uh, the top three species of whites, looking at how much color there is on the veins of the wings really is gonna be one thing that helps you tell those species apart. And then some of these are also, um, Telling these two apart, this orange sulfur and clouded sulfur can be pretty tricky, but you sort of go by if it's more orange or more just straight yellow. And then this is my favorite group of butterflies, like I said before, the blues, coppers, and hair streaks. They're all relatively small. Uh, the blues, the males are often bright blue on the upper side. That's how they get that name. The coppers, like this ruddy copper down in the corner, are orange on the upper side. And then the hair streaks are named a hair streak for their tails. So a little bit hard to see, but there's a tiny little tail on these, on this uh, thicket hair streak and this gray hair streak. These are what we call tails. So that's how that group gets its name. The brush-footed butterflies, or another name for these are the nymphalids. This is a very big group um, that sort of has a mishmash of lots of things in it. Some of them um, are orange and black. A lot of them you can see here are orange and black. There's quite a bit of size variation. So this um, Myletta crescent is a relatively small butterfly. And then uh, those, many of you are probably familiar with how big a monarch is. So that would be one of the biggest butterflies in this group. And then skippers, these often get overlooked. People, um, you might see one and not even realize it's a butterfly at first. They do fly so erratically and so fast. And they're pretty darn small. They're pretty hard to catch. Um, and it, this is definitely usually the last group of butterflies that uh, people learn the different species because they're pretty hard to tell apart. But there's ones that are iridescent black to brown, like this sooty wing here. A lot of them are what we call golden skippers. So they are golden on the upper side. And then uh, we have a common checkered skipper here too. And that is, this is probably the easiest check, uh, species of skipper to learn. It eats mallows and weedy mallows. So like a pigweed is an often a, weed in lawns and it actually eats that as a host plant, um, as the plant that the, the, one of the only plants that the caterpillars of this butterfly eats. So that's the introduction to different uh, groups of butterflies. If you're interested in learning more about different species, learning those groups first will really help. And then we're going to move here into just some stories about some of my favorite species of butterflies that live in Nevada or rare ones that I have been lucky enough to study. So here we have the pygmy blue butterfly. This is the smallest butterfly in Nevada. It is almost the smallest in the world. A tiny butterfly in China just beats it out. 
they eat um, tumbleweed as a host plant, which is pretty crazy. That's what's in this picture here is tumbleweed. And uh, on the left is a painting I did of one of these pygmy blues. The next slide here I have to show you just how small these butterflies are. This is a desert dandelion bloom. If you're in southern Nevada, this is a pretty common wildflower and actually grows really well too in yards if you want to plant it for pollinators for butterflies. But uh, it's not a very big flower and it totally dwarfs this tiny little pygmy blue here. And then these are two specimens from the Natural History Museum next to a dime. And you can see how absolutely tiny they are. So this is another butterfly that if you aren't train, training yourself to look for very small, small butterflies, you might miss it. Like I said, they eat tumbleweed. They also eat some native plants that like alkaline salty soils. So if you're in sort of a old lake bed or a salt flat, that would be a good time to look for pygmy blues. Or if there's a lot of tumbleweeds, um, you can skin around looking for these. One incredible thing about these is that we believe that they uh, disperse hundreds of miles. So they, reproduce a lot when it's warm. So they re reproduce a lot in Southern Nevada and Southern California. And then into the late summer and fall, they expand their range northward. And we believe that they travel hundreds of miles, but no one's really documented this. So this is something that I hope one day to be able to study or learn more about are the movements of these absolutely tiny butterflies. The next uh, butterfly that I'm going to talk about is this uh, subspecies of a skipper. And this is one that is known only from one place in Nevada, which incredibly is the highest point in Nevada, the very top of Boundary Peak in um, the White Mountains. So this is in Esmeralda County, Nevada, just south of Hawthorne. Um, for those of you who think about the White Mountains, they are um, a big defining feature of Bishop. So when you're in Bishop and you look east, you'll see the White Mountains, you'll look west and you will see the huge uh, Sierra front there. So there's only a little bit of the White Mountains in Nevada. Um, and the, the little bit in Nevada is Boundary Peak. And so my husband and I went looking uh, for this butterfly the past two summers. And uh, in this photo, you can see the tippy top of Boundary Peak over here. So here I am actually right below the peak of Boundary Peak surveying for other butterflies in this mountain meadow. And unfortunately, uh, I have a two-year-old at home, which is not the unfortunate part. The unfortunate part is that I couldn't drag him to the top of Boundary Peak. So Kevin had to go without me um, up to 13,000 feet. And he did indeed find uh, just a few feet below the summit, this tiny little skipper butterfly way up there at 13,000 feet. This is the um, peak of Boundary Peak right here, the summit up here. So butterflies do extraordinary things, right? <laughs> Some of them love mountaintops and like this one that's is the only place in Nevada it's found is on this crazy mountaintop. So then this summer we were looking for another rare um, blue butterfly and this one uh, eats just one kind of plant called Herman's buckwheat. So most buckwheats are small flowers herbaceous plants, but this buckwheat is the only one in Nevada that's a shrub. And it has uh, leaves just for a little bit of the year. It really leafs out in the spring and then those leaves sort of dry up and curl away. And I think when the leaves are gone, it almost looks like a coral. It's crazy. There's just all these intertwining stems, uh, dried stems left. So I was uh, 
surprised and a little worried about looking for a butterfly that only eats this dried up plant. But here we are. This is in uh, El Dorado Canyon, south of Dayton, Nevada. This is my dad in the lower right of this photo and my son, Leon. And we are uh, out looking for this butterfly. I think we went out three times before we finally found it, which was so exciting. So um, sometimes it's easier to find butterflies when their host plants are in bloom. So this is what this buckwheat looks like when it's in bloom. And we, here we have a male with its wings open in the uh, lower part of this photo on the left. And then here, I believe this was a female in the upper part of this photo. And on the right, I didn't, uh, this is actually my dad's photo, so I didn't, um, I wasn't there when he took it, but I believe from the way she's curving her abdomen under that she's about to lay an egg. So we were very excited to find this butterfly, this subspecies of butterfly um, in the, there's a state agency that monitors rare plants and animals in Nevada called the Nevada Division of Natural Heritage. And they had no reports of this butterfly being found since the late 80s. So we were so excited to be able to go out and find this butterfly again. I thought I should uh, talk a little bit about the monarch. And if you read World of Wonders, you know that there's a whole chapter on the monarchs. So monarchs live in both the West Coast and the East Coast. We'll look at a map of their migration in a minute here to understand those sort of two populations across the United States. But before we do that, I wanted to talk about their life cycle. And so here is a butterfly egg next to the, the tip of this pencil so you can get a sense for how absolutely tiny they are. And as butterfly eggs go, a monarch egg is actually a fairly big one. <laughs> as you can imagine, a pygmy blue butterfly has a much even smaller egg, which is incredible. Here is uh, what we call a first instar. So the tiniest caterpillar right as it is hatching from its egg, it just ate that hole out of its egg to come out. And then we have what the caterpillar or the larva looks like, the pupa or the chrysalis. And if you read the monarch chapter in World of Wonders, you know that the um, family was very sad when their monarch did not come out of its chrysalis. Here are three monarchs that did just, just recently in this photo uh, come out of their chrysalis. This one is still pumping its um, wings full of blood or hemolymph and stretching those wings out. And then they'll dry in the sun and they will be able to fly after they have dried for a few hours. If you've never seen a monarch chrysalis in person, they're absolutely amazing. This beautiful green color and those dots on them look like gold. They're just, as sparkly and as incredible as gold leaf. Monarchs are um, relatively easy to tell apart, males and females. Females have thick veins and males have thinner veins and these um, scent patches here on the wings or spots. Like I said, monarchs in the US are split into two uh, real populations, those that live east of the Rockies and they migrate to Mexico to spend the winter to forests in Mexico. And then our West Coast monarchs go to the coast of California and spend the winter there. So this actually, as they gather together, is a really good time for scientists to be able to count them. So I know that there's a lot going on in this graph. If you don't like graphs, you don't even have to look at it. I will uh, walk us through it. The main point that I want to tell you here is that there used to be millions. So this graph starts at 1997 and there were over a million monarchs counted then. In the 80s, there were, you know, 
many millions of monarchs found in the coast of California um, as they were overwintering there. So these counts are all done at Thanksgiving, the same time each year. It looks like there were none found in 2020, and that is actually because there were under 2,000 found, which is a um, pretty steep and terrifying decline if you love butterflies. And I know that this is um, fairly depressing. I will tell you, not all butterflies are in as much trouble as monarchs, but there are many butterflies across the Western US whose numbers are really um, dropping precipitously. And I think it is definitely possible that we will have no monarchs in Nevada in the future. So monarchs will continue to reproduce on the coast of California, but this migration into Nevada um, may not may not keep happening. So we will come back in a little bit to things that we can do to help butterflies. Um, but I'm gonna put a, a small plug in before I talk about that for the importance of long-term monitoring. There's a lot that we don't know about butterflies in Nevada. There's a lot of common species that we don't have a good handle on how their populations are doing. So one thing that we got to do this summer is go out and survey for butterflies in the Toyabe Mountains. So that is a big mountain range right smack dab in the center of Nevada and um, Nye County and extending up into Lander County. So here we are. These are um, members of Matt Forster's lab at UNR and other grad students um, counting butterflies. This was just uh, last weekend that I got to go uh, do this. And we hope to go back every year for 10 or 20 or 30 years and count butterflies. So we really have a record of what's there. This again is in the Toyabe Mountains, just lower down in a, in a meadow there. If you are interested in finding butterflies, I have some ideas for you. So looking for places with a lot of flowers in bloom because adult butterflies drink nectar. So they need flowers with good nectar sources. Places that have a lot of plant diversity means you might find more butterflies there. So butterflies need uh, the leaves to eat as caterpillars and usually they can only eat a few kinds of plants as caterpillars and then as adults, they need to drink nectar. Oftentimes they can drink nectar from a wider variety of plants, but they might have some favorite species. I usually find butterflies in places with water. I have the most luck finding butterflies in mountain meadows and by mountain streams. So if you need to beat the heat and you have some mountains around you, going up and looking for wet places in mountains is often a good place to find butterflies. And also gardens with a lot of native plants will attract butterflies. If you're in Southern Nevada, my very favorite place to go visit and walk around and just be is the Springs Preserve. And so these are two photos of different butterflies that I saw just walking around the Springs Preserve. I wasn't in the, they have a butterfly house too, but I just love the grounds of the Springs Preserve and all of the native plants and demonstration gardens they have. On the left here, we have a crazy butterfly that's called a snout because <laughs> of that giant nose on the butterfly. So this is called a snout butterfly. And then this is a little uh, marine blue that is um, pretty uncommon in, in Northern Nevada. So I enjoy going to see uh, more of them when I get to Southern Nevada. Also going up when I talked about going to see mountain meadows, um, you could go up to Mount Charleston to look for butterflies. There's actually several kinds of butterflies that live nowhere else in the world, but around Mount Charleston. Red Rock Canyon and the Clark County Wetlands Park are all good places to go looking for butterflies. If you're in Northern Nevada, Probably the place closest to Reno that I've seen the most species of butterflies is the Hunter Creek Trail. Um, and along the Steamboat Dritch Trail there are both great places to look for butterflies. Galena Creek, Tahoe Meadows, 
Rancho San Rafael, lots of swallowtails um, there, and Washoe Valley. I'm a little bit biased because I actually live in Washoe Valley, but going up uh, Deadman's Creek, there's lots of stinging nettle, there's butterflies that uh, only eat that as caterpillars, um, and also just in the meadows of Washoe Valley. I've seen quite a few species of butterflies. So uh, Western butterflies are really in decline. If you want to help them, there's several things that we can do. Um, reducing pesticide use is really important for lots of insects. Um, in World of Wonders, there was discussion about how firefly populations are really dwindling. So one big thing we can do for fireflies if you're in the East Coast is reduce pesticide use, it really helps all insects. Um, so that's one thing you can do for butterflies. And then also growing native plants is a great thing that you can do for butterflies. So here I have a list of some of my favorite native plants to grow. Almost all of these are available from the Nevada Division of Forestry Nurseries. If you're in Southern Nevada, the nursery I believe is on the north west side of town, you can look it up. And if you're in um, Northern Nevada, the Nevada Division of Forestry Nursery is in Washoe Valley. So globe mallows are great plants. Um, they have orange flowers, they are, the host plants for some painted lady uh, butterflies, also for those checkered skippers, they eat that as a caterpillars. Pinstamins, I don't see as many small butterflies visiting pinstamins, but a lot of bigger butterflies like swallowtails will visit pinstamins. Um, pinstamins are also just great for bees. Buckwheats, a lot of um, butterflies eat buckwheats as caterpillars, they're good. Uh, pollinator plants for them too, to drink the nectar. Milkweeds, that's the only plant that monarchs um, can eat as caterpillars, so really important for that. This here is a picture of a swallowtail on yarrow. And then lots of uh, butterflies eat willow as host plants, and it's also a great source of nectar early in the season. And finally, rabbit brush is probably the best source of nectar for butterflies in the late fall. Often when I'm out hiking in the fall or early fall, um, I will find a rabbit brush and it's just covered with all sorts of bees and wasps and butterflies. So there's some non-native plants that are great too. So butterfly bush, the name doesn't lie. It'll bring in lots of butterflies. Um, if the common, another common name for that in the genus is Budlia. Mints and herbs. So lots of your garden herbs, um, kitchen herbs, if you let them go to flower, they'll be great. Oregano, uh, mints, time, all of those have flowers that are really popular for smaller butterflies. Carrots, sedums, and lantana are all good too. I wanted to just for inspiration show you a few pictures of pollinator gardens of different sizes and maybe if you are so inspired you can check these out. So my husband was working for UNR's cooperative extension and he put in some of these pollinator gardens across Nevada. So this one is actually right in downtown Las Vegas on a very busy street. It's at the intersection of Tropicana and McLeod. It's a pretty small um, garden, but it shows you that even in a small amount of space, you can pack a lot of plants in that are great for butterflies. So we have a pinstamen on the left here. We have primrose or the bigger white flowers in the foreground. It's a little bit past flowering, but in the back on the right here, we have a globe mallow. One of my favorite um, museums in Nevada is the Lost City Museum in Overton. Um, there's a lot of wonderful history of the native peoples that lived there. Oh, there's beautiful basket weaving, all sorts of things. And outside is this pollinator garden. This is my son, Leon. Um, 
And this was in this spring, we were there in March. If you're up in Northern Nevada, we just put in a huge pollinator garden at the relatively new Rosewood Lakes Nature Study Area. So this is at the intersection of Pembroke and Veterans on the east side of town. And I believe just two weeks ago, it opened to the public. So it's a great place to walk. It's a great place to see lots of different kinds of birds. I believe they've counted over a hundred species of birds on site so far. And so with that, I will say thank you. Uh, this is a picture of Hunter Creek. Like it says, great place to go looking for butterflies. And um, if you have questions that I don't get time to answer or you think of later, here's my email. I'll leave it, leave it up a bit in case um, you wanna reach out to me with any questions. And now there's lots of time for conversation and questions too, so. Thank you, Cynthia. That was so great. I love all of your stories about, you know, trying to find butterflies, especially, um, you know, at Boundary Peak. I had no idea that, well, first of all, like that was, you know, a space where, where butterflies could, could live, let alone just, just one kind. So that was really, really neat. We did get a couple questions um, in the chat while you were speaking. So I'll try to go through them. I think you did answer some of them. Um, although the, the most recent question is asking about the difference between male and female butterflies. Um, Fran, did you mean to, um, were you talking about monarch butterflies or did you mean um, just male and female in general? This was during when you were chatting about monarch butterflies. There you are, Fran. might be frozen. So I can tell you that um, in general, you sort of have to know each species of butterfly and whether you can tell males or females apart. For my friends that are really good at um, monitoring for butterflies and counting them on the wing. Sometimes you can tell from their behavior, whether it's a male or a female. So females will spend most of their time looking for places to lay eggs. So they'll fly maybe more slowly, closer to the ground. They'll check out plants versus um, the males are looking for females. So sometimes that means they'll be flying really fast, zipping here and there. Sometimes they'll be chasing off other males. So the more you watch them, you can sort of learn some of those behavioral differences. And I will say that I am still learning some of those behavioral differences. So that is not, not always an easy thing to do. And like I said, uh, you sort of have to go species by species to know how different males and females are. I, in response to your question, when I tried to unmute, I got out of the meeting and so, I, I did get in and listen. I was talking about monarchs because I have monarchs in my yard, but I live in Southern California. And yeah. um, wondering, they look so much alike, but the behavior, I've noticed the differences in the behavior. And I noticed one thing that was fascinating with must admit male and female, they, they were making what looked like a wagon wheel in the air, two of them spinning around in the air and never seen any butterflies do that before. So that's that, awesome. thank you. Yeah, and I will say, uh, just keep watching them. I love to see, uh, especially with monarchs, but other species too, we think of them as spending a lot of the morning eating and resting, and then the afternoon they sort of reserve for mating. So I hope you'll get to see some more mating um, and really keep your eye out in the, in the afternoon for that behavior. I have one or another question. When they're born, yeah. do they save some kind of geographical marker? Because I find monarchs coming back. I'm, this year, I don't have any milkweed. And I'm trying to transfer over to native California and not get the mm -hmm. not native. Yeah, which is great for lots of reasons. So yeah, yay. lots of reasons. But I keep yeah. seeing them come through the area that I had before with milkweed. So is there a geographical marker left when they're born? Because I know they're migrating, but it's just strange to see them come to this one little, these areas in my yard. 
Yeah. Um, I don't have a great answer for you, but I would say that there is some evidence of that for sure. And uh, they, they do for their migration, they you generally have three generations a summer. So it is like the great grandparents that are making that migration back to the coast of California. Um, and we do not understand all the ways that they navigate and how they hold that memory. So it would not surprise me if there is some um, memory of good patches of milkweed in places where they were born. But the incredible thing is that it would be like four generations back, usually where they would be maybe coming back to that same spot. Um, yeah. So definitely mysteries in how their, their memory works. Thank you. Yeah. Someone was wondering, um, do you know how butterflies got the name butterfly? There is a um, thought that it is maybe named after those uh, white ones that I talked about that sort of have a butter yellow color to their underside of their wings. So that is one thought is they're named after that butter, butter yellow color. Great. Um, and then I think you you answered this question. Um, someone was asking, you know, what kinds of flowers or plants are butterflies attracted to in Nevada? So um, I really appreciate sort of your geographical distribution, but also, you know, here are some other like non-native plants that butterflies um, and caterpillars might like. Um, so I think we're, we're good with that question. Um, I had a question of my own, which is, do you know, like, what are sort of your, your techniques or strategies for approaching butterflies so they don't run away from you if you want to get closer? Yeah, yeah. Just to move slowly, slowly and stealthily. So I could just take pictures of butterflies all day, um, but it does take some patience. And so what I usually do is take a few pictures from far away and then I creep up and I move as slowly as I can and I take more pictures as I get closer and sometimes I scare the butterfly and it flies and I get really sad because I missed the perfect shot <laughs> but then once in a while I move slowly enough I'm able to get right up you know just a few inches from them and get a really good picture so um it will I just know from experience it is um more frustrating to do that in a place without a lot of butterflies. Like if you only see one, you're gonna, you know, I get really frustrated that I miss it. So it is definitely more fun to go to some place with quite a few butterflies. So you have several chances to sneak up slowly um, to see them. And the other thing is there's a whole uh, books written about viewing butterflies through binoculars. And there's people who love butterflies who really advocate for just studying them with binoculars and not with nets. So there are um, binoculars that are sort of meant to be able to focus in that like six to eight foot range or as close as six or eight feet. And so that is another thing is you can get some binoculars that are meant, meant for sort of some of that closer range. And with those, you will be able to see like the underside of the butterfly if that's what you need to see to be able to identify it. Um, I was wondering, you talked about the heat earlier. I was wondering how did the smoke or do you know how the smoke affects them? So we don't think it's good. <laughs> we think yeah. it's a bit harder <laughs> for them. I'm not sure that I can elaborate uh, too much more than that. They're definitely like at once very fragile and also very hardy, right? They have these incredible migrations. Um, some of them can withstand freezing and they're just fine. So uh i think the smoke is probably hard on them i'm guessing they probably need to drink more if it's really smoky um i also have been out on very smoky days and seen a lot of butterflies flying so oh oh yes you may have seen oh. that question in chat <laughs> yes 
So there's a question about what is the best way to catch and release a butterfly or moth if it gets into the house? Um, so you want to beat up the wings as little as possible. Um, I don't have a problem using my hands. So I might use my hands to try to catch it. Um, not everyone would be feel comfortable with that. Uh, there's the whole like just using a cup, you know, like you might try to get a spider, put a cup over it and slide a piece of paper under the cup and move it that way. Um, I, I can't think of anything too good if you don't have a butterfly net besides that. Just the, the more that you handle the wings, you can do um, damage to them. Um, if it's a bigger butterfly, their wings are, are hardier. So like you can ho hold a monarch or a swallowtail by its wings and not hurt it, but anything smaller, you're stuck to take the scales off of the wings. Um, so also it doesn't hurt them at all to touch their feet. So you can hold a butterfly, you know, if you're only touching its feet, you, you won't hurt it at all. So sometimes you can sort of scoop them up, moving, like I said, looking just really slowly, but you can go approach a butterfly and put your finger under its feet if it's not too wild and sometimes catch it that way. But if it's really flying around, that, that technique is not gonna work very well. So. Cynthia, are there other butterflies or rare butterflies that only live in kind of like one spot or area that you know of? Yeah, there's a lot. So um, last year, the past two summers, so uh, 2000, getting confused of what year it is, 2020 and 2019, there were seven um, subspecies of rare butterflies that we were looking for in the White Mountains. And uh, so that was just in that little bit of the White Mountains that is in Nevada, right? So just that tiny piece, there were seven, seven fairly unique things that didn't, didn't have a bigger range outside of that or a very big range outside of that area. And then there's probably another, I don't know, maybe 50 or so subspecies like that across Nevada that are rare. And so over the next few years, it's definitely my goal to learn more about those and to contribute. There was a um, butterfly enthusiast and scientist named George Austin, who lived, I think he passed away about six years ago, but he is sort of the butterfly expert of Nevada. And so he named a lot of these subspecies. Some of them, um, there's not that many more people than him that have ever seen them. And so a lot of what we're doing is we are using his records and going back and trying to find um, these rare butterflies. Some of the best studied of the rare butterflies are definitely those um, around Mount Charleston, like the Mount Charleston blue. So, uh, but even for those species, I think that there's more that we can learn. Some of the fires on Mount Charleston reduce their habitat and we're still learning how they are gonna come back from that. Um, it feels like for a lot of these, you could you know, have several grad students or scientists studying them for several years and all you would do is come up with more questions than answers. So there's, there's a lot more to learn about rare butterflies in Nevada. I would say. Thank you. Yeah. Cynthia, is there anything that you'd like to share about what you do with Nevada bugs and butterflies with us? Uh, well, I will just say that if you are really, if this, um, really sparks your interest today, one thing that we started is a community science program um, called, let me go through here, the Nevada Butterfly Monitoring Network. And this is part of a national program, the North American Butterfly Monitoring Network, but volunteers go out and they survey the same site 
for at least six times a season. And so if this is something that someday you think you might have the time and energy for, um, feel free to email me. Uh, if you want to follow us on Facebook and the webpage, uh, <clears throat> we're sort of done for the season this year of trainings, but we might have trainings or I'm sure we will have trainings um, in the spring in future years. So this is a way that um, people can get involved. If you know us, you know that uh, we did have a butterfly house with all native butterflies in it, um, north of Reno for five years. <coughs> in the past, then we hope to someday have a butterfly house again at the Rosewood um, Nature Study Area. So also, if you're interested in that, follow us on Facebook. That's probably the place where we update the most, but also we often um, update our webpage when we have big events or, or big news like that starting. Great. Are there any last tips or bits of information you'd like to share with us before we close out with today's workshop? I think oh, sorry, I think I um, yeah. Oh, just a quick question. I was wondering, have there been any, like in the last several years, like new butterflies that have been discovered? So I don't know of any in Nevada because it was really um, George Austin and a few others were sort of the driving force. <coughs> and I'm pretty sure that there have been other new subspecies found um, in other parts of the U.S. recently, although I don't have a good story for you off the tip of my tongue. So, um, no, I, in Nevada, I'm not sure of any that have been found really recently, I guess is, is my best answer to that. What's the name of the books you mentioned at the beginning? Uh, for the Nevada Humanities Reading Group, or? There were two books that you referred to. Oh, the butterfly guidebooks? Yeah, let me, um, let me put that back up here. So these are our two favorite butterfly guidebooks. You know, and I haven't checked whether our local independent bookstore, I'm not sure that Sundance carries the, carries Kaufman all the time. I think they have a Kaufman guide, general guide to insects, but I think you might have to special order the one for butterflies if you're in Northern Nevada. And I will say the Swift Guide to Butterflies is available actually as a pretty nice ebook too. So I have it um, on my phone. I hadn't uh, really been asked that before, but during one of our butterfly monitoring trainings, uh, someone really wanted to have the guidebook on their, their iPad. And so this uh, Swift Guide to Butterflies, you can do that. You can get an ebook. We can be sure to, I'll get the names of those books from you after this workshop and we can email it um, after your next workshop concludes. So everyone will have okay. that information. Okay, sounds great. Great, well, if there aren't any more questions, um, again, please feel free to email Cynthia at any time. Um, but Cynthia, thank you so much for you know, sharing your knowledge and passion for butterflies with us. Um, it was just such a treat hearing all of your stories, seeing all those lovely photos. Um, you know, I, now I'm just, I wanna open up a book and dive more into you know, the world of butterflies and insects. So, so thank you for that. Um, so for everyone, um, if you'd like to learn um, even more about butterflies, we do have a second workshop this Sunday at 10 a.m. with Cynthia again. I believe we'll cover um, similar material, but you're also going to talk about maybe a couple different topics. Is that right? 
Yeah, I'll talk about another um, community science program that's more independent, an app and a website called iNaturalist. So we'll spend some time talking about that on Sunday. Great, and of course, all of you are welcome to join. Um, and then again, um, you can always learn more about what we're doing is um, on our Nevada Humanities website. You can check for our Nevada Reads page. We're always updating that with more information and, and programming. So we hope to see you at future events. And of course, you can also sign up for our newsletter. But um, Cynthia, again, just I want to thank you for, you know, uh, just sort of spending your Wednesday afternoon with all of us. And we just really enjoyed having you here and just learning from your pool of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad I could share um, all that information with you all. And uh, thanks. It seems like you really enjoyed it. So I was very, very happy to be here with you today. Well, thank you all so much. I hope you have a great afternoon and hopefully we'll catch a few of you again this Sunday. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bridget, do I have to press pause? <laughs> I'll let you stop the recording then.